Welcome everyone to uh, our presentation uh, for the 60-day intensive. This serves as a preparation. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, it will be two hours. And as always, this webinar is being recorded. And um, as always, we welcome your questions and participation. And uh, let me say for Jim and I that it's wonderful to have you all here and we thank you very much for taking the time out and being a part of it. Any comments you have or thoughts or questions, um, please let us know. We'll get to as many as we can. We're going to move pretty quickly. This is not to teach necessarily, it's to overview, show the process, and uh, let Mr. Dalton do his uh, thing, which he does so well to present his material. So with that, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And I will introduce Mr. Jim Dalton. Well, Happy New Year. Um, Miss, Miss Julia is stuck in Florida. Uh, the weather on the west coast has, or on the east coast, has kept her maroon. She's been bumped from two slight flights down there, and now is not scheduled out till Thursday. Um, She's a little frustrated, but she sure didn't sound it. Julia, I'm, I'm with you, and I wish we could uh, get you home. There's right. worse places to be stuck than Key West. <laughs> the, uh, this, the, ne the intensive coming up has got a whole, going to have a whole new twist to it. Um, one of our institutional clients, and uh, Jim, I hope you don't mind my mentioning your name if you're, if you're on with us. Um, his name is Jim, Jim Stewart. Jim used to run a, uh, a bond operation, and he now is a, uh, a very senior uh, person in, a, um, in an overseas bank. Jim sent us a, a book called The Power of Habits. Um, I have been dancing around the things we will discuss from that book for many years. This book really brought it together. Um, this is going to allow us to function much heavier, much heavier on the self-understanding portion and how about changing some of the behaviors that we all have that can be destructive. So we'll be talking more about that later on, uh, but let me, uh, let me get started. Okay, Julia, why didn't the page down work this time? Try your arrow. That? Try your arrow, oh. Jim. We test. There we go. Um, okay. What are we really trying to do uh, when we start to prepare for a day? The, the the most important thing, the most important thing that we do to start with is preparation for the coming trading session. Too many times, traders know this is the right thing to do, they talk about it, but they get busy and they find reasons not to do it. This is something that you have total control of. The markets you can't always control. What you do in preparation, you have total control of. And that gives you a very important leg up on the people you are competing against. When we are pre preparing, what we are trying to do is gain a top-down perspective. That's why we start, we go monthly, weekly, daily uh, bar charts, and we go to the profiles, this top-down perspective. Then we go um, and we try, and after we've looked at the profiles, we try and define at least three potential scenarios for the coming session. And if possible, we want to say, is there a ruling reason for this session. You may remember uh, those who get the written comments and look at the post, you may remember that coming into last Thursday, my ruling reason was the market being too short. You can go through everything else, but when the market's too short on a day time frame basis, very often it has to handle current business first. So that was one example of ruling reason. So what we're trying to do, we want to start with, a, a, get a, a, gain a top-down perspective. We want to get at least three potential trading scenarios for the next day. And we want to try and determine if there's one thing that we think is going to be more important, at least as the following day opens. 
gaining a top-down perspective. We do it by starting with and looking at the monthly bar. We look to see if there's a long-term trend, if there's a direction to that trend, an age to the trend, and additionally we look to see if there are good, clear, visible references that go with that, with that trend. So let me just very quickly, um, as we do this, let me very quickly go over to CQG and I look at a monthly bar. Let me get some of those prices out of there for a second. So when I look at the monthly bar, it doesn't take much to say the trend is up. So far this month, we are in an, we are in an inside within last month's range. The trend is still up. There is no change from that perspective. When I look at long-term references, you know, I'll take the excess, I'll take the excess high that occurred a couple of days ago. Next, after we've got that, so sometimes this doesn't take a long a lot of a lot of work. If you do it every day, um, you stay current and it's it goes pretty quickly. Next, after we've looked at the long term bar, as we just said, the trends are all up. Uh, January is within December's range, but there's no sign of any meaningful change. Next, we look at the weekly bar, and we want to see if there's a trend within the long-term trend. Are we with the long-term auction, or are we looking at a, at a counter auction? So one more time, let me go back to CQG, and let me look at the weekly bar. Ah, when we look at the weekly bar, now we start to see a totally different picture. Um, let me show you. I colored this out ahead of time. When we look here, and this will be the report going up. This is the start of the report uh, going out to the uh, those that have already signed up for the intensive tonight. But when we look at the weekly bar, we say, all right, I have a three-week balance. That makes the upper distribution. I have a lower distribution. And those two distributions are separated by the 1818 level on the chart. You may recall today that one of the posts that I put out, if you were looking, was that the market was targeting uh, the gap that was at the 1818 level. It filled that gap trading as low as 1817.50. So now as I'm going through my work, I'm coming in and I'm saying, as I come in to Tuesday, the 1818 level is what Julia and I now label as a go, no-go decision level. Now what can happen from this level? You can either fail to get down into the 1818 level, in which you start to rotate back up at the potential go to the all-time high. If you get accepted back down below this level, now you're in this lower distribution that carries the market down to the 1775 level. So you look and you say, okay, as I'm getting prepared for tomorrow, I'm already thinking about potential scenarios. Am I going to stay above this just above 1818 or am I going to find acceptance back down below it? Now I've and but I also see it's important because I'm looking at a three week low. I'm looking at a three week low. Uh, I'm going to call this an intermediate term um, reference. So if I get down below this, I've, this signals change on the first full trading week of 2014. Very important that when I'm talking about getting that top-down perspective. So before I even go to the daily bars or to the profiles or start to, to work on what I, specific trades I want to look for tomorrow, you can see how that top-down perspective is already starting to form. Monthly trends still up. Weekly trends gives me an alert. I'm at an important go 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 no go level, and this could morph into an intermediate term trade to the downside. Okay, now we go back. 
So that's the weekly bar. We, we've covered the weekly bar. On the daily bar, we look for short-term trends with other auctions, counter to other auctions, or long-term reference, uh, long references, uh, change, long, changes in long-term references, or, short, or are changing long-term references to, say, short-term references, for example, meaning it may be a long-term reference. We looked at 1818. That was a little longer-term reference coming into today. Now it changes. It's a short-term reference tomorrow. It may, it may impact both intermediate and, and short-term, but tomorrow it's every bit a day time frame short-term reference as we get ready to trade uh, tomorrow. Next, I go to the daily profiles. Again, I look for short-term trends. Do I have any balancing? Do I have any structure? Do I have any volume uh, references, short and day time frame references? And then I start to develop trading scenarios for the next trading session. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going down. I'm now getting down to the point where I'm getting fairly serious and all my work is coming down to an action to an action level. I want to get ready for specific trades tomorrow. Okay, let's go back and let's let's take a look what I, what I have here. I put this is this is um, Window Trader. You already are aware, and we'll mark it here. But you're already aware of the. The 1818 level, we went to 1817.50 today or 1817.25, um, depending on which chart you're looking at. But you're already aware of the importance of the 1818 level as we get ready to trade tomorrow. Now, when I bring that down more specifically, looking at the day time frame profile, one of the things I will notice is that I have a lower distribution that takes me down just slightly below that 1818 level, and I have an upper distribution. That upper distribution coincides with last Thursday's low, or coming into today, we were talking about the importance of the two-day balance. So this was a key reference as we came in today, 18, 1821, the 1821.75 level. So we had an inside day on Thursday, on Friday. We had a two-day balance. Our most important reference today was the two-day balance. So we look down. So we look tomorrow, and we have a lower distribution. We have an upper distribution. So as I start to build my potential scenarios for tomorrow, they will start off with uh, one. If I start to build value within within an overlapping to the downside of the lower distribution from today, then my breakout from the two-day balance is intact. And if I start to build lower value and overlapping the lower value relative to today's lower distribution, I am back in the lower distribution we showed on the weekly bar. In other words, if I start to see value down below the 1818 level, I have con I have confirmed the breakout from the uh, two-day balance. I am now finding acceptance and balance building down within the lower distribution you saw on the uh, on the daily bar and that or on the weekly bar and that has the potential to take you all the way down to the 1775 level. So that would be one of my scenarios. Another scenario is that I totally reject this lower distribution and I open back up above 1821.75. I leave this lower distribution as excess and now I start to build value in the range above the 1821.75 level. So that would be that would be a very positive scenario scenario unchanged value relative to the lower distribution 
trading right in through here. That would be a neutral to negative um, scenario. It means I'm still below the two-day balance, but I have yet to find acceptance back within the lower distribution shown on the weekly bar. And then, of course, my negative scenario would be I build value below this or gap below this and, and really start to find acceptance in the lower distribution. So those are kind of like three potential scenarios that I have coming in that I'm thinking about already as I prepare to come in for tomorrow. Now, I'm going to take my analysis one step further. My value, there was Friday's value was right here. Today's value was overlapping. There's Friday's. Let me, let me put the line across that. The red line represents the low of Friday's value. Today's value was overlapping to lower relative to Friday. I look up here, I have an excess high, an inside day, lower value. So my short-term auction is to the downside. I now want to say, what kind of volume did I have going down today? I look at the volume, and it's slightly under 3 billion. It is not particularly strong volume since we're back into the full trading arena for 2014. So I'll note that it's not particularly strong volume. That's a, that's a question that downside continuation may not be as clear as price may, may have wanted me to believe. Now I look at the shape and I look at along with the volume I look at the shape. I do not have an elongated shape. I have a shape that indicates to me more than likely that I had liquidation today rather than a more potent combination of liquidation and new money selling. So when I look at this, I'm somewhat cautious. I don't, when I'm looking at this, I've got three scenarios. I know my monthly chart, there's really no change. I look at the weekly bar, I know I have the potential of for downside continuation and for change tomorrow, but I also know I'm at an important go no go decision level relative to the weekly to the weekly bar. I know that decision level is right around the 18 18 level, which is about the low of today's of today's market. So when I go down to that low, I didn't have particularly good volume, and I didn't have a lot of elongated shape. I have a point of control up here, a point of control up here. So when I look at this, I'm not terribly enthusiastic. I know my short-term auction is down, but I'm not terribly enthusiastic about continuation to the downside. And I don't want to get carried away in thinking, wow, this is going to be the real big killer to the downside. I want to recognize, as we talked about building our potential scenarios, we said scenario one, I recognize this potential. I also recognize the potential if I open above um, this distribution, this upper lower distribution, that I have the potential to have left excess um, from the 1818 level. Now you might say, well, Jim, there's only a couple of single prints. That's great, but I may, I may see this. If I open above this tomorrow, I may consider this whole area as, as excess. Okay, that's where that's where I'm that's where I am is I get ready to prepare for the following day. Now this is before I've seen the overnight or anything else. Julia, let me stop at this point and let me take some questions about preparation. I only want to, I only want the questions on what we have discussed so far. Julia, are you there? Yes, none that are relevant to preparation. So if you, we have some intraday questions. Um, okay. So if you want to continue, and we'll get to the intraday as you get there. It's up to you, sir. Okay. Okay. So that's that's where we are from a preparation from a preparation standpoint. And we will come back, and we will talk about we will talk about what happened today, as I was 
have been preparing um, the written report for tomorrow. I put a note on there, and the note said that if anybody uh, uh, that there was no recap on today's. Usually, it's a recap and preparation. I said there was no recap today because the recap is going to be covered uh, in the webinar tonight. And if people weren't able to attend the webinar, I put a note down there that uh, that Julia had recorded recorded it. So that takes me up to my preparation as I am ready for the following day. And what is so important is that those that are taking the intensive, whether they're taking it, whether you are taking it for the first time or the second time, the best thing you can do is do your own preparation. Think about what we've done here. Practice doing your own preparation after you have done your preparation, then take a look at what Julia and I send you every night and compare what we have done to what your preparation looked like. Let me caution you. Good, the, the wrong thing preparation. Some people think they have done the preparation and they will take their charts and they will have a whole series of numbers and references on it. That is not, that is not preparation. That is an, it's an easy way to you know, label numbers and things like that. You want to go through it, at least at this point in time, from the monthly to the weekly to the daily to the profiles. We're going to talk a lot about habits, but it is a habit you want to form right now. That is, if you really want to be successful, that getting in the habit of routinely doing your work every single day, do it the same way. If, if trading's not linear. But the preparation, the preparation for the following day can be, and I think should be, very linear as and part of a process. Okay? Let's go back and let's see what we've got coming up on the... Uh... We've got a couple of prep questions, Jim. Okay, please. Number one, so if you think that the market gets too short, does Jim look or prepare for possible short covering, which is old business for the next morning? Absolutely. If we open right here, remember... Point to that level, Jim. Can you say okay. the price? If we open above the 1821.75 level, more than likely, the market was too short. The market was too short. And then, and if you know it was pressing pretty hard here late this afternoon, and then it broke again late in the day. If you get above this level tomorrow, you want to be very careful because you may get a very sharp short covering rally that takes you back up towards um, the high. And here's, a, here's just a clue in here. When you're going through this analysis, and I, I should have mentioned this because notice the top red line is Friday's high. The lower red line is today's high. Very mechanical. Within two ticks, market went up within two ticks of Friday's high. When I'm doing my preparation, that's something I also record because that's a very mechanical point for the market to sell off. More than likely, when a market sells off from that level, the selling took place by short-term traders rather than from longer-term, more important traders. And I say more important because the longer-term money tends to be stickier. It's not in and out as often. Had it been longer-term, the, the market opened at the green dot, which is the, there's the opening. Tried to trade higher for a while before it broke. Oh, a much stronger opening would have been open right on the high and sell off. But the fact that this is two ticks above it alerts me that it was more than likely short-term money. Then I combine that with how elongated or how thin this market was early on today. And I, for those who were looking at the post, I said it was more than likely liquidation. So, and that can get the market too short. I, so I'm looking, I said this wasn't, in my opinion, wasn't a real strong sell-off because these highs are so close. The volume was 3.9, wasn't even over, 2.9, uh, it wasn't even over 3. 
I didn't have elongation on the entire profile. Instead, I had double distribution. But even even that is not elongated. It's it's fairly, you know, this is one, two, three, four, five, eight wide down on the lower end. So I don't have in I have indications of liquidation today, but I don't have indication of anything other than a lot of short-term selling. That alerts me to the potential that I could have short, that I could be looking at a market that is that is just too short. Um, look on over one one. Uh, Julia, how do I spread out the market profile? Expand. Right profile? click over the profile. Okay, there we, okay there we go. great. All right. On the far left, one one. This is this goes right to the question that was just asked. You can see the market was not elongated. Today's was a little more elongated, but this was not elongated. You have the 45 degree line from the bottom on up, 45 degree line is usually an indication of a market that got too short. I had written on Thursday night, um, when it was the first, was that, do I have the right day? Um, yeah, that was Thursday, right? Yeah, okay. that was Thursday. Thank you. Okay, so I had written both in the recap and preparation port as well as in the pre-market update we put out in the morning that the market may be too short. Now, so I was prepared for that. The market opens higher and for one, two, three periods it trades higher. Now, if I remember this right, I think it traded uh, just a few ticks, finally traded a few ticks above the overnight high. The overnight high and low are always serious day time frame references. What I thought was occurring, that because this was slow, there's the opening, B, C, D, so you're now talking about an hour and a half. You just feel that market trying to go higher, and all I can do is get a couple of ticks above the overnight high. It did not get any of the single print telling, selling tails from the previous day. What I was feeling is that was just the market handling the short inventory from the first. Once the inventory was covered, now the market had an opportunity to begin liquidation to the, to the downside. So I won't cover what else went on that day, but that is important. And so I'm always prepared for short covering. I'm coming back over to today's, and my thinking will be the potential for short covering tomorrow. That potential for short covering is really embedded when I look at my scenarios if I get back up above um, this lower distribution more than likely I've got the, sh the shorts squeezed. Jim, so, could you yes. just, I don't know if your mic moved but I can't hear you quite as loudly. Okay, is this better? I think so, we'll see. Okay, okay, all right. Now, so, so I hope that answers that question. Yes, I am always looking for signs that the market may be too short or if the market was rallying to see if the market may have been too long. Okay, was there another question before I go on? Julia, are you there? I beg your pardon. Uh, how long does it take you to do your nightly recap and preparation? It takes me, I'm down to about 30 minutes, and it wouldn't be that long except I have to, you know, pull the charts down, type it, and, uh, you know, make it look kind of nice and send it to Julia to be repackaged and, and sent out. But no more than a, than a half an hour, and most of the time it's 20 minutes because, in effect, I'm, I'm consciously, maybe even subconsciously, doing the update all day long <coughs> as I'm watching the... Um, as I'm watching the market out there. But the actual preparation, between 20 minutes, 20 minutes and a half hour. And I do that, I do that the night before. I like to do it as soon after the market has closed as possible because I want to be able to do it when what happened today is still fresh in my mind. Okay, uh, I'm ready to go on unless there's another I, question. 
How was the 182175 two day balance determined? By the two day low. Right there. There it is 18 182175. Okay. It's just, it's just a simple mathematical or just a simple there's the line. Um, How okay, another go ahead. Hello? How does Jim look for old business versus new business? Well, that's what we were just talking about. That's exactly what we were talking about. We, I beg your pardon, we, Jim. It was 11 minutes ago, so maybe you've covered it. It's just a lot of questions oh, okay. coming through. So if it's covered, just ignore me because I'm typing while I'm listening. Okay. Yeah, that's when we, when we were talking about the lack of elongation. You know, we went back to last Thursday and I showed the 45 degree line. You know, that's an indication that the market may have been too short, which is old business. I look today and I'm not elongated on the downside. I didn't have huge volume. I've got two points of control and I look at that and that's an indication that I may have a market that's pretty short. It made the low early in the morning and it never could take that low out. So that thought is going through my mind. Okay, another question. Yes, um, the, the three scenarios, do you have a bias or are they all considered equal? No, they're not all considered, they're not all considered equal. Um, on today, today they're fairly equal because I'm at that go, no go level. And the market wasn't, let's say the market had been elongated to the downside and I had, you know, almost four billion contracts. Now my bias would probably be to the downside. But this market, this market broke. It wasn't elongated. I'm at a, uh, at a level, an 1818 level that divides the two distributions. You saw that when I used the weekly bar. So I really don't have a bias today. I, I think that, I think I've probably got a chance at it. 18.18 is probably uh, pretty close to a go-no-go no go level, just as we said. And okay. I'm willing to go either direction uh, tomorrow. Other days I will have a bias. Okay, okay thank you, Jim. Um, and just so everyone is aware, because of the way the template of Window Trader is set up currently, Jim's charts are one day behind on the time axis, on the horizontal uh, scale. So you got to think 1-2 is 1-3 and so on down the line. Um, and thank you, Mark, for mentioning that. Closing, this is a question for you, Jim. Closing towards the low of the daily bar, what does it mean for tomorrow's preparation? It doesn't mean anything to me. I look at the, uh, I, I look at the, the, the whole thing. I, I, don't, I don't do a lot of focus on, uh, on things like that. To me, the, 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 the settle or the low, the settle or the close is, much more of a random event. Some people get all excited about it. I just, I just don't. Um, so you know, if I come down and I close near the, I settle near the low of the bar, that just may have been late liquidation, and the, and it may have trapped the more short. So I don't. It's none of, it's nothing that I spend any time on, uh, okay. in here. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, the profiles are much more the magnifying glass for that time frame. Um, would you consider 1823.50 to 1824.50 an anomaly? Because no, it I traded see, there every session no, except for two periods. No, I, see, I see two distributions. I see two distributions today. I don't see anything more than that. Okay, you know, sir. Mean, you, you can always you can always look too hard. To me, I see two distributions. I see the 1818 level. I see two distributions. And I'm, you know, I treat each distribution as a separate day or auction. Okay, so that's some idea of what we go through in in the daily preparation. And this isn't all I'm trying to do is give right now, give you that feeling. I want to go to gain that large perspective from top top down. Gain a larger perspective. Look at the monthly. Look at the weekly. Look at the date. Look at the profiles. And then I want to come down and I want to end up my research prior to the overnight trade. I want to end up with a minimum of three potential scenarios for the following day. Later on, we're going to talk a lot about habits. We're going to talk about from a much different way than we ever have before. 
doing the preparation every day is a habit that you can control easily. It's within your power. There's going to be other habits as we get into trading that are much more difficult to control. But the reason for having these scenarios is once the market comes under pressure in the morning and we start to get you know some wild trading and price gyrating back and forth, if you haven't thought about the potential scenarios, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to act with the speed that you need to in order to be competitive. If you have already thought about those, that scenario, you are going to be in a much better position in order to react to the market. Very, okay. very important. Let me take you through an example. Um, first of all, um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go do this with CQG. I can do it a little, a little tighter. I'll be just a second. Get this set up the way I want it set up. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of having the scenarios in, in mind. The, first of all, I want to apologize. I know I offended some people today um, by making some comments about um, uh, covered shorts, and I didn't tell people, you know, where I would have gotten short or where they could have gotten short. So I apologize. I will change my terminology going forward, and I'm I'm very sorry I offended anyone. But here's here's what was going through my head today. I think the Ruling reason today, I was watching the prominent point of control, the lower end of the profile from Friday. I knew I had a two-day balance. I knew Friday was an inside day. I knew I had a point of control down here, an anomaly up here. But I was focused, my ruling reason was on the prominent point of control. The next thing, and we haven't gotten to it yet, but we will in a minute. The next thing, I was watching the overnight inventory. And the overnight inventory, when I wrote the, uh, the uh, pre-market report the, uh, this morning, the overnight in inventory was slightly long. Uh, fairly well balanced, but slightly long. But then, by the time that report could, went out, until we got to the opening this morning, the market started to rally higher in the overnight, long before we open. And while we're looking at this, I'm sitting there saying, here's the point of control down here. I already thought there was a potential for the market to have gotten too short. So as I'm watching this market and I'm focusing on this, the market is rallying up here. The overnight low was right around the, um, just a second, let me see if I can mark that. I may not be exact. I think the overnight low was right around there someplace. So I'm watching the market. I'm march, watching the market rally, and it can't really hold above the overnight low. Once it can't hold the, over, the overnight low, and it failed to take out yesterday, or Friday's high by two ticks, I am sitting and saying, all right, I've got the prominent point of control, which is my ruling reason. I've got overnight inventory now has gotten quite a bit, quite long. And if I can't get above and hold above the overnight low and I can't get out Friday's low, more than likely, what is likely to set up in the market? You all been there. If you fail, if you fail at Friday's high or you fail at the previous day's high, more than likely, what is going to be the direction of the next auction? You know. It's a continuous two-way auction process. So I've got the scenario that it may have been too short. I'm watching, and then the market starts to give way, and it gets back down 
to that point of control. So I was, I was prepared for the market being too short. I had my references on the day time frame, and I was able to handle the day. That's the kind of, that's the kind of thinking that you need to go through as you look at this. And we're going to get to the next step with looking at overnight inventory. But I wanted to bring it out right now. Just to, when you do the, the scenarios, you're always looking and say, could this market be too short? The market broke. There it is. See how fat it is. That's like old business, not new business. You've got an anomaly up here. Market well could have gotten too short, and that appears to be what happened. Okay, let me go on to the next slide. Um, we've got the trading scenarios. Now, the next thing. Can you go to full screen, Jim? Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. I've introduced this idea of habits already. The first time I introduced habits was in the preparation. And I'm saying that is a habit, an easy habit to form. It takes time, it takes discipline, but it's not, it doesn't take a lot of emotional, it doesn't take a lot of emotional pressure to do the preparation. You need a little knowledge, you need to work, you need a little discipline. But there's other habits that we're going to be talking about. And as we get into this full scale, I'm going to make a recommendation and a plea for anybody that is taking the intensive that starts here in a couple of weeks. Read the, the one power week. of one week. Read the power of habits. Why we do what we do in life and business. Don't skim it, read it, devour it. It is probably it is probably one of the most useful books I have ever seen on the market. Secondly, you should go back in reading, and if you go back or read Daniel Kinnaman's Thinking Fast and Slow. It is also very important. The most important book is Habit. This is also important. And what is important about Thinking Fast and Slow is understanding how we arrive at anchors. One anchor may be the previous day's high or the previous day's low. It may not have any significance other than it, once it was the high or low, it now becomes a lot of traders' anchors. Very important to understand anchors. But this book, this book is a must. I'm going to talk more about it before we get done. But please go back and read it. Um, for your, for your, not for me, but read it for yourself. Um, this, book, this book will help me. Uh, will help me tremendously. Uh, and also, a lot of these things that are in this book, I've been dancing around for years. Um, this allows me to bring it together, together and communicate uh, much more coherently what we are talking about. Okay, let's go on with habits. Can I ask you a said, question, Jim, about preparation? Um, um, how do you consider longer time frame inventory? That's a, that's a really a, a, a good question. Yes. Um, it is something that I've used the term many times, carrying information forward. So for example, as we were coming in to the end of 2013, the markets were very thin. There were, there were a couple of gaps. Uh, structure was, was not elongated, very chunky. When I'm looking at that, I'm taking that all together, and I'm saying all inventory is becoming very long in here because, and because of the, the gaps, because of the low volume, and because of the structure. So I'm looking in total, and I'm saying there's an awful lot of risk coming into 2014 being long this market because it appeared to me that all inventory was overly long coming into 2014. Now, let's say that the let's say that the market had been going up, it had been um, not overly elongated, not overly chunky, had good volume, you know, good symmetry to it, then it may not have alerted me to that. I may say this is a healthy a healthy market. Or let's say another scenario. Let's say coming into uh, 
the start of 2014, late 2013, the market was trying to go lower, but it had poor structure on the downside and didn't get any volume. Then I may say, hey, they got the market a little bit too short coming into 2014. But it's, it's a cumulative thing, and this is the importance. What happens when you do your preparation every single night, you start to get a sense if you think inventory is too long or too short. And you get a sense of the time frame that you're dealing with. But this emanates from doing your work every single night rather than from one, you know, one look or one say, I'm just going to go look for this right now. It's one of these things, it develops day by day. Okay? Now, let's go back to pre-opening. We've, we've got our preparation, and now we're ready for our pre-opening review. We're going to look at overnight inventory. And you know we look at the open, we look at the high and the low of overnight inventory. We look to see if overnight inventory is long or short. Julia kept track during the last um, intensive, and about 65% of um, overnight inventory was corrected um, the following day. Today was another wonderful example of it. Overnight inventory was long, and you saw the and you saw the correction take place almost from the opening. So many people get mesmerized by price. I say, wow, this market's pretty strong. Look at this market going up into the opening. This must be pretty strong. I'm looking at the market this morning. I'm saying this market's getting very long, not strong, but long, and I'm looking at the point of control. So overnight inventory, is it long? Is it short? Knowing there's a high, the odds are high that there will be some correction, counter auction to the overnight inventory, and even if there isn't, sometimes if the inventory is long overnight, for example, it may restrict, it may restrict any rallies early in the morning. So there's many reasons to look at overnight inventory. Additionally, we know that the overnight inventory, high and low, is always a daytime frame reference. We've seen that over and over again as we go through and, and moderate the, in, the intensities. So overnight inventory is first. Next is my expected opening based upon, um, expected opening based on overnight trade. Am I in balance? Am I in balance? relative to the previous day, am I out of balance? If I'm out of balance, to what degree? It's all part of the, the other preparation we did the night before, this preparation we're doing in the morning, and we're getting ourselves ready as we come up to the time for the opening. For example, let me, let me go back for just a second. Yeah, and if there was any confusion, Jim just meant the overnight high there. Sometimes they'll mix up high and low. Uh, so. Oh, okay. Take a look at last Thursday. Thursday is right here, one three, and I mentioned um, I showed what happened last Thursday. Let's split this out. I showed the market was too too short from the previous day. Got the short covering rally in the morning. Um, but also, notice, and I didn't mention this, but notice where the opening took place. This was the opening, right? There was the opening from last Thursday. Well, just one tick below that was the center of, I'm sorry, the opening for Friday. The lower line, 1828.75, opening for Friday. The midpoint of Thursday's range was the 1829.75 level. We opened just below the center of the range. So when I opened, also when I opened in the range, in the center of the range from last Thursday, more than likely, what am I looking for? I'm more than likely looking for a rotational type of day because the market isn't greatly out of balance. As you can see, it failed up the high, failed down, down below, it rotated back and forth, opened within the range, about center of the previous day's range. Tremendous information. It tells you that the market's not grossly out of balance. And that's important information. 
we, when it's in balance, you're looking for shorter term trades with shorter opportunities. When it opens at the extreme of balance or outside of balance, the odds are so much greater that you're going to have more significant opportunities today. Again, extremely important information. And again, it's information you can be accumulating and working on prior to the actual bell going off that starts, you know, all the adrenaline and endorphins going as price starts moving back, back and forth. So again, so far we've looked at all of those things you can do prior to the market being open, prior to having the pressure on you that price is moving back and forth and you start to feel, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? You also at this time take your charts and mark the levels that you think are important on your charts. As you go through those levels throughout the day, just take a pencil and just mark them. Put a check mark by them. Do something so you're constantly, constantly aware of what's going on. What I'm trying to do is get you to focus on the bigger picture of what's going on in the market rather than be overly focused on price. You also want to make, you know, as we start this, well, let's, let's go forward. Let's see the next slide. Um, you've marked your charts with your reference. Can you go to full slide, Jim? Because some people can't see it as well on laptops. I, 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 Thank I you. Understand. You have to remind me of that every now and then, don't you? Um, it's okay. Okay. So again, we're through the we're through these. We've got we've marked our charts, and we know if we're in or out of balance. And we're looking to see if there's anything that we think may be ruling reason today. For example, the market's too short, or maybe there's a big number coming out a half an hour after the opening. Okay. Now the market is open. Once the market is open, if you've done all of the other work in preparation, now you are in a much better position to be able to deal with all the volatility that occurs around the opening. First thing we're looking for is the opening itself. We already talked about where does it take place, but next we want to see if there is confidence to the opening. The highest confidence openings, as you know, will we'll, we'll trade right at the opening, and then we will move directionally from there. Second highest opening, you know, we move one way, we move above it, maybe come back through it, or we look back through it and come back above it. So that's you can get an open, an open test drive um, in either direction. A lot of times, you'll just be continually back and forth through the opening. Okay? So if you're rating the amount of confidence, open and drive is going to be the highest confidence. Open test drive is going to be the lowest or second uh, highest confidence. So in other words, if we open, tested lower, drive high, higher. Open, tested higher, drive lower. That's the second highest level of confidence. Then we get to the point where we're back and forth through the opening multiple times. When that happens, you know immediately that you're in a low confidence environment. In other words, nobody really has any idea what they want to do. At that point in time, you want to you want to get yourself prepared to kind of step back, let the market churn, let let the market chew up a lot of people, give it some time, then look to see if you see an opportunity. Now, where this gets confusing sometimes. I may say, well, give it time. I may say, I'm neutral coming in. I'm going to let the market, I'm going to give it some time. But all of a sudden, 15 minutes later, maybe I see an opportunity. Well, we may open. We may open in a low confidence environment. We may be back and forth through the opening. But then let's say all of a sudden the market goes and trades above the overnight high and fails. All right, well, it may only have been 15 minutes. But now I have a reference. So I may say, all right, I'm, I'm, interested, I'm interested in trading against that, against that reference. The same thing may happen at the previous days, high or low. You know, you're always looking at, at the different, um, 
you're always looking at the different references you develop. One of the things that uh, Julie and I talk about a lot is you'll see dynamic references. Dynamic references are areas that can train, contain substantial volume. So you go to a level and you're back and forth and you trade substantial volume at that level. That becomes a dynamic reference. Let's say, for example, there's a significant volume at 1850 and 18 up to, to uh, uh, 1819. And then we trade a little higher. We say, okay, it was a dynamic reference. And we're just buying at that level at that point in time. If we come back through that level, we know that that reference may now be turned, is buying early, may be turned to sellers, because as we come back through that high volume reference, there may be some forced liquidation. Again, we are when the, once the market is open, we're continuing asking ourselves, is the market in balance or out of balance? in balance or out of balance, and to what degree. Again, I'm not here to teach these things tonight. It's just a refresher. They're all things you've heard from me before. It is just getting how you, you know the work you do before the market opens. Then it gets a little more difficult once the market opens because things are moving faster. You have to think a little faster. There's conflicting information that can throw you off. If you haven't prepared, a lot of the information is going to throw you off. If you have prepared, you may have scenarios that you're just looking for the opportunity in order to engage the market on your terms. And Jim, I know this is a question it's difficult to answer, but it's kind of in flow with what you're talking about once the market opens. You know, we have this data just streaming at us and trying to parse through it and determine the ruling reason if there is one or some type of what is driving the auction. And this gentleman is asking, what is the determining factor in switching scenarios? And I know you can't answer that specifically because it depends, but if you wanted to touch on that point, because we have lines in the sand where we've got it okay, overnight high or low, or prominent point of control, where we can lean on to say if it doesn't go through here, you know, we're still in the, um, it's still trending up, nothing's changed, and that sort of thing. But if you wanted to address that, Jim, please. Well, thank you. Julie is right. There's, there's, there's no absolute answer. But when we're talking about that, we're talking, this is today, and we're talking about getting ready for tomorrow. And I'm talking about, okay, let's say that the market opens right around today's settle, which is the circled green line. Okay, so when I open at that, if they open at that level, first thing I say, well, are we going to balance? Okay, so I may be thinking my balance scenario. All of a sudden, the market opens and the confidence is high, and we straight up into, away from the lower distribution, into the upper distribution. All right, now my scenario switches to, all right, um, I've got a pretty strong scenario underway. Or it opens here, I'm thinking potential balance, and then we single print out of here with high confidence. Then I'm switching to the downside. So they may, they may throw you some curveballs in the morning. But as long as you have those scenarios, you, you're going to have to go with the flow, and you're going to have to work with them. But at least, at least you already identified this potential area, the potential down here, the 1818 level, potential balance, you've got some basis in order to allow yourself to be able to go with the flow in the morning. So for example, the market may have looked really weak to you, but maybe the inventory was too short, and all of a sudden it surprises you, you're all biased to the downside. We open here and we sprint up into this area and say, wow, I'm above this lower distribution, this may be short covering, so you're switching to go with this level. Okay. Jim, a couple of, um, yes. pardon me, just a couple of questions on open test drive, number one, and open drive. Was today an open test drive? I think so. You know, th these don't always fit, you know, perfect definitions, but I, I think today was an open test drive. It opened, it opened, it tried to trade higher, and it got very sluggish up there. Now it didn't really drive lower, it faded lower more than driving lower. But it was it was it was close to it. It tested higher, it failed, and then it just started to give way as more and more people realized that they were caught 
long from overnight inventory, and the sellers came in. So it was it, it was about as close as you're going to get to an open test drive. Yes. Okay. Another okay. Question. Second question is, how long do we wait to determine an open test drive? Um, you know, is he, are you talking in the first few minutes? I do, there, there, there are no answers to these questions. There's no absolute answer. The, the reason that we reason that we do the intensive over 60 days is that we can constantly examine those issues and get a feel for them. There just isn't, there isn't a concrete answer to it. You know, like this morning. What I tell you this morning was a perf perfect open, you know, open test, open test drive. No, it wasn't perfect. Was it an open test drive? Yes. But each one will be slightly different, just as each of you is slightly different. It's once you have the concept, it's through your powers of observation that you start to build confidence. Now you also have to take in other things. Let's say an open and test open test drive in the middle of a previous day's range is certainly different than an open test drive today that occurred at the top, just below the top of Friday's range. So those two open and test drive, just to think open and test drive by itself, is relatively worthless. Being able to think of open test drive relative to the other context, for example, today at yesterday's high, was wonderful. I mean, that's a whole different context. And, and people were saying, well, Jim, you said later on you covered a short. Well, we don't know that you went short. Well, and, and again, I'm not going to tell you that, but once you look at that, you look at the, in the morning at that open test drive, you've got, you've got uh, Friday's high. You can go short at that level with your stop just a point or so above Friday's high. It's one of the things that determines a trade a lot of times if you can find a structural place for a stop. And today was a structural, you had a structural place, you had a very prominent point of control down there, so there's reasons to do it. So open and test drive by itself isn't of much value. Open test drive or open, open drive um, is far more relevant when you reach the level that you see it in the context at which it occurs. Okay. Is there another question before I go on? Um, well, you know, we have questions, and it's so difficult to cover all these concepts. They're in the field of vision DVDs, and obviously going through the 60-day course, these are things we're just going over and over, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, wax on, wax off. But there's a question here, Jim. How do you know what time frame is in control? It goes back to your preparation. You start with the monthly, you go to the weekly, and you go to the daily. Those are the questions those are the questions you are constantly asking yourself as you go through that process. There isn't, there isn't an absolute answer to any of these questions. Some of them take some, some, some reasoning. Um, you know, today, when, we, um, when I said early this morning, and this is, again, the reason for the intensity. If anybody was looking at all the posts I put out this morning, the, one of the early posts I put out, I believe, it said, "This looks like it looks like liquidation, because it's it's too fast." Well, when I said looks like liquidation, at that point in time, that's my way of saying I think this, this is day time frame. I think this is in the day in the day time frame. So you have to deduce it from what is what is going on from the day. You know, we didn't get out. We didn't get outside of Friday's range. So early this morning, early this morning, we were still within Friday's range. So we're, and Friday was an inside day. We were still within balance. As we went through today, it took an awful lot to finally get below the two-day balance. And once below the two-day balance, there was no real downside, no real downside follow-through. So you've got to ask yourself, do, is there really evidence that the other time frame is involved? Or was this more than likely just day time frame traders? That's the kind of thing that, that you have to we go through the intensive over and over again, and you do your preparation. Those are the kind of things you're constantly working on, um, and it becomes it becomes a lot simpler. It becomes a lot simpler and a lot more natural. Now, I talked today, and I showed the the weekly 
the upper weekly distribution, three week distribution, I showed the lower distribution. Now, if I get if I get accepted below the 1818 18 level tomorrow, then I think I've got, I think I've got a little more selling coming in from the longer time frame. Not necessarily the longest of time frames, but the time frame that is beyond the day and short term. To go in, so I'm down below a three-week low. I'm back into a distribution. I think lasted six or seven weeks. More than likely, that is a time frame that is beyond uh, the day and short term. Remember, day is today. Short term is three to five days, maybe a little bit longer. But at that point in time, I said, okay, now I got a pretty good chance. I'm seeing other time frame participation here. Then what do I look to verify that? I look for elongation. I look at volume. Uh, you know, and if I've really got some serious participation, I'll get some elongation, I'll get an increase in, in volume. It's an ongoing process, but there's not, a, there's not a lever that says yes, no, it is or it isn't. It's constantly evolving, and you get there by being in the flow of the market. You get in the flow of the market by doing the, going through the process we've just been talking about, the monthly, the weekly, the daily, looking at the profiles, looking to see do we open in balance, out of balance, overnight, it's that process that is just so valuable as time goes on. Now, once the market is open, I'm looking for developing value. Is it going to be higher, lower, or unchanged? I'm looking for just somebody said what time frame is in control. It's like today. What do I think? Time frame do I think was in control today? I think it was. It was day and short term time frame. That's all I saw. Um, I would, I would what I put here. I would devote develop an abbreviated notation key, and by that I mean there is a tremendous amount of evidence that shows there's a huge mental difference and connection between writing something down and not writing something down. When I'm talking about, if you take your charts, if you do nothing but have some code or just a check mark when you've been through a reference, write it down. If you think the confidence is high or low, make some notation. You know, HC, high confidence, LC, low confidence. I don't care what it is, but something that you write down. Developing value. Where do you think developing value is going to be? Do you think it's going to be higher or lower, unchanged? I'm going to, I'm, before we're going to talk more about this, I think the most important thing you can ever do is this idea of understanding where developing, where developing value is likely to be. Make those notations. Note what has happened. Think about what is, what is possible. Today, if you were following the chats, I was sitting there putting out chats to you, and it said, um, one of them said that the uh, Friday's low was poor. The next downside target would be Thursday's low. Thursday's low said the next downside target would be the the the, the gap at the 1818 level or wherever that whatever that gap was. So I'm looking ahead. I'm taking it a step at a time. I'm looking ahead. Is what is possible. And that helps. And we got to all of those things that were possible today. We got to all of those things. And and then um, and then I put out, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is where I offended some people. I now Let me show it. Let me show you what it looked like. When we were down, just after we filled this gap, which was down at the 1818 level. We were still in, make this a little bigger, we were still in E period, and I put out a note, I said, I've covered my short. That offended some people because I never told anybody where I was short. So I'm sorry about that. I will rephrase in the future, and I will say, if in fact you have a short, this would be an ideal place to consider covering that short because I don't think there's much left. I changed the wording this afternoon. If you were looking at the posts from this afternoon, 
These are the people that have already signed up for the intensive. If you were looking at the post this afternoon, when the market rallied up to this up to this level, uh, just a little bit above it, I said I wouldn't be. I would. I would be. Un I, Julie, I don't remember the exact words. I said I would be very uncomfortable being long here, and being uncomfortable being long because the lift, the lift was too weak. After we came back into the two-day balance, the lift was too was too weak up here. It was doing an awful lot of work getting the shorts covered, but there was very little follow-through to the upside. So I wrote I would be very uncomfortable being long because the lift was too weak. Okay. So when I'm looking at that, all I'm trying to do is make an assessment. And it looks to me at that point in time like the risk of being long is fairly, fairly high. Now, everybody will do something different. To one person, they may say they want to be short. Another person says they may cover a long when this market broke out of this level down here. But this was the same thing down here. Remember this morning. The confidence I thought was low up here because we were only two ticks from uh, two ticks from Friday's high. That's not high confidence. When the market came down and it initially traded at Friday's low, it rallied from Friday's low. It rallied all the way back up. To at that point, fuck you. Mark this. Oh, sorry, 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 right. sorry, sorry, sorry. As the as the market rallied from the low, the early low that tagged Friday's low, it came to within one tick of being half back, which was the red line right here. Now that also told me something. When a market goes to one tick be below half back, it left a poor low. Is that high confidence or low confidence? That is short-term trading. That is short-term money getting squeezed up there. That's not long-term money. You have the poor low, and it goes exactly to that. And when it broke from, from exactly half back, one tick below half back, and then put in the new low, at that point in time, I was pretty comfortable. I was pretty comfortable that it was pretty well done for the day. Simply, there wasn't the confidence. The confidence wasn't there from the being two ticks from Friday's high, being able to go to within one tick from half back, four low. Those are not high confidence markets. High confidence markets, they will cut through. They won't leave a poor low. They'll cut through it. They may hit it once, a little bounce come back down to it. So you're constantly accumulating that information. This afternoon, and this this was what was going on this afternoon? The red line right here that I'm looking at, 182175, who remembers what that line was? That was the two day low. Traders sold in G period at a half a handle below the two-day low. Who do you think does that kind of selling? That's not what long-term money does. That was short-term money, trying to be exact, coming to two ticks below. Then, since that worked and the market went down, traders did it again at H period. They did it again at I period. Now, I was on the phone with a friend of mine when the market was trading right down here in the J in the J period. And my comment was, can you imagine the stops that have built up just above the eight the 1821 to 182175 level? We no longer we were still talking about the think about it. A high, it's a high, it's a high. There's a reference. What were traders doing? Short-term traders were selling this, putting their stops right above it. We were still down in here, and I said, can you just imagine the stops were there? All of a sudden, the market was gone. The market was gone through this. Boom. That's what happens. That's Again, when I'm doing these posts throughout the day, 
I'm trying to, and particularly for short-term traders, I'm trying to keep your focus here. We're, as we go through the 60 days, we'll do more and more. Try and give you an understanding away from numbers of what is going on. We want you to be able to understand the market in terms of the behavior of those people you are competing against versus just understanding the market via numbers. And then when this market went, when the market went back up um, and it couldn't carry, there was no carry, value was still very much lower for the day. At that point in time, you had an idea. If there's really strong, the market should have continued to lift and taken us quite a bit higher. In fact, could have challenged the high for the day. It lift was one, you can see this one period, two period, three period, four, just very, very heavy. Again, that's one of the feels that you start to develop in the uh, uh, in trading. Okay, um, so know what has happened and what is what is possible. We've already talked about these: developing value, trend, confidence, tone, volume, structure. Your references. You're continually. Go, just as I walk through that last example, you're looking at half pack. You're looking at unchanged. You're looking, which is the settled. You're looking at the overnight high and low. You're looking at the daily high and low. You're looking at the two-day high and low. It's that constant. What you want to do is be in the flow with the market so you have some idea what is actually transpiring. Now, we're getting down to where things are really going to start to change. One of the things we said before, you can control risk, but you can't control profit. Let me go back. We're talking when, when the market rallied, let me collapse this. When today's market rallied early, there's the opening, it rallied trying to take out Friday's high, and it couldn't. And if you want to go short here, you can control your, you can control your risk. Your stop is probably someplace right up. Your stop's probably someplace pretty tight in here. If this is going to be any good. So you can control this risk. You have no idea how far down this market's going. You have no control over this whatsoever, but you can control the risk. Now, if you, you have, when the market came to halfway, the BCD level here was a single tick below half back. If you wanted to go short someplace in here, you can put your stop you know, a handle or so above half back if you're a day trader. You can control that risk. You can't control what happens on down. So one of the habits that if you really, if you really want your trading to be successful, one of the habits you can do is say, I'm not going to do a trade unless I have a structural place to put a stop or I have a reasonable place to put a stop, not based on, on price, not based on what you feel, but based on something related to structure in the, uh, in the marketplace. So you, you can control risk, but you cannot control profit. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about here is this idea of value. I believe that the most serious problem confronting any trader is the tendency or the propensity to get mesmerized by price. Remember, price advertises opportunity. Time regulates all opportunity and value measures and, and uh, volume measures the success or failure. We want to trade value, not price. Now, I understand it's not quite that simple, but I think if you made one or two changes 
as you start your trading for this year, and they are, I will not, I will not put a trade on unless I have a good place for risk control, a, a, a structural stop. In other words, I may think it's a great trade and my emotions may be going wild. I don't want to miss it. I'm afraid to get in, but I don't have a place to do a stop. I'm not going to do the trade. Easy to say. I know how hard it is to change a habit. But you ask yourself how many times that has happened. And then you say, how many times have you get suckered in by price? If you trade value versus price, you will generally be in that you will be trading in the direction that the market is going. Now, I've used the word keystone habit here. One of the things, and when I talk about the book, um, The Power of Habit, Paul O'Neill was the, the tre Treasury Secretary. Before he was the Treasury Secretary, he was selected to be the chairman of Alcoa. When he took over Alcoa, and he comes up in his gray suit and his red power tie, and all the big you know, analysts and everything are sitting in the room waiting for this dynamic speech, of these people that come up and they give a rah-rah speech and they tell you that everything's going to be wonderful, this is a great company, blah, blah, blah. He goes up and he says, Alcoa is going to be the safest company to work for. People are stunned. And there's some questions, and you'll read the whole, you have to read that book and you have to read all of the book, but this is so key. He said Alcoa is going to be the safest company to work for. Answered a few questions, said to people, you guess you didn't hear me, it's going to be the safest company to work for. A lot of these analysts ran out of the room and they told their clients, sell the stock. For every million dollars of stock they sold, um, it was worth a million dollars more uh, by the time Paul O'Neill left Alcoa. What happened by changing this one keystone habit? Any time there was a requirement, any time there was an accident, the, the manager had to report that accident directly within one week. And if it was, the, if it was an accident that took place uh, when the, in the smelting, you know, and the hot fluid and thing like that, then it was redesigned so that didn't happen again. Well, it, the whole company became more efficient. Um, the, the assembly line was more efficient. Wherever the accidents took place, and as this continued, he, oh, he also put in the first um, email system so that these people could report all of these accidents he had a computer system set up in, on all these offices so that they could immediately report via computer into the, to the accident report. So as they accumulated these, this became so efficient by changing that one habit of everything being safe. The comment was made that it was safer to work for an accounting firm. It was safer to work for Alcoa than it was for an accounting firm. And, but what happened, by changing that one key habit, it affected, because it was key, to, it affected everything. It affected the efficiency of production. Uh, it, affected, it affected morale. The union, who had opposed a lot of things Alcoa wanted to do, the union got on board. People started offering suggestions of things that could be done to make it more efficient and safer. People that had been afraid or had never been heard in the past, and all of a sudden, you've got, you've got this wonderful example and this very efficient company, and the and the stock goes up a million a million dollars. Um, and you you it's hard for me to explain it for you to get the feeling of the importance of changing a habit. Alcoa is a great story. The whole book should be read. It should be understood because I'm I'm going to guess that all of us have bad trading habits. The other day when I mentioned, first mentioned this on the, uh, on the chat room, I said one of my bad habits, that I, and the reason I would set out to break it this year, was that let's say I get into a trade and the trade goes up and I'm profitable, 
but it's not profitable enough to be meaningful. I said, ah, that's, it just, I get this psychological feeling. Well, that wasn't even worth being in a trade. I'll hang around a little while. And I can tell you, it almost always gets worse. But I've, the more I've done it, the more it became, the more it became a bad habit and the more troublesome it became to my trading and to my profitability. Now, you say, well, but I'm pretty good at taking the loss, but I wasn't good at taking a small profit. And I don't think it was greedy. It wasn't this idea of greed. It was this idea of that wasn't even worth my time and effort. That was a habit, and that single habit is very, very non-productive. It keeps you out of good trades. It leads to losses. Well, we all have those. Some people, some of you have a habit that you want to trade early in the morning. You just can't help yourself from trading early in the morning, even if there's nothing going on. You're so afraid that you're going to miss the you're going to miss the big trade of, of the day if you don't trade early. And then you say, "Well, Jim, but I'm watching this. I'm watching this. You know, which way which way is it going to go? Guess what? You got to break those. You got to break those habits. You got to get down to the point where you say." There's things that have to change. First is acknowledging them. That means you have to write down, and you have to be very honest with yourself. Before you start this intensive, and before you get any further into this year, take a very healthy self-assessment of where you think your problems are. We can teach you market understanding. It's not easy, but we can teach you market understanding. Self-understanding and you know, this control is much more difficult because everyone is different and it's different to a different degree. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that two of the keystone habits for this year would be developing value, trade with developing value, and only trade when you have a structural place to put your stop. Now, I understand it can't be that way 100%. But for example, but you can take two, one or two. You can't change any time you make this resolution. I'm going to change this and this and this and this. I'm going to be an all better person. Nothing happens. You're trying to undertake too much. I'm saying take one or two keystone habits. And if you're only going to take one, take trading with developing value. That, that will help get you away from price. If one of your habits, and I'm going to guess that most people have this very poor habit of being mesmerized and sucked in by following price. Maybe some people it's going to be, I talk about how distracted you get looking at five minute bars and 15 minute bars. And people tell me, well Jim, I only use it to get in and get out. And you know, I just go, it's a bad habit because once you get that narrowly focused, you are not going to keep track of the of the bigger picture of what's going on in the in the marketplace. So make a self make a self self assessment. Talk about what do you really think the the self understanding issues are you need to work on this year. Decide to change one of them. Don't change any more. Just try one. And I'm going to suggest a structure place for a stop or trade only with developing value. And it's a start. It's a start. And see if those keystone habits don't flow and all of a sudden affect things that you never thought about them affecting. I, this, this, I can't say enough about this, but we're going to work on this constantly through this intensive in order to take it to a new level. Julia, I've talked. I've talked enough. I know there's questions out there. Uh, we can open up for questions now. I'll take questions on today's trading. I'll take uh, overall questions. Um, go ahead and fire away at me. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. That's that's excellent. Um, everything you shared, and uh, we appreciate it. So um, let's just start with this one. Are liquidating breaks usually engineered by the bigger short time frame players? No, liquidating breaks. Liquidating breaks occur when all of a sudden. Well, let's let's take a, a day time frame liquidating break. Let's take today's <laughs> liquidating break. They're not engineered by anybody. If they were engineered by by anyone, they would hit the high and they would sell off rapidly. You just see boom. 
Well, you see today, it just went up there and it just kind of stood there for a while. It just hung there last Thursday. What happens is the short-term money gets too long, say, for example, the liquidating break. And all of a sudden, somebody starts to sell. Some selling begets other selling, begets other selling. Those of you who have ever seen me in some of my earlier seminars that I used to give, I use the example, you know, when you used to be on in the floor. And one example I used in the floor, palms in meant buy, palms out meant sell. And what would happen a lot of times is the crowd, the herd of the crowd on the floor would get too long or too short. Some of the bigger traders would realize this, and all of them, let's say they thought the market was, was too long, and they thought all these short-term traders on the floor were all positioned the same way, all too long, and all of a sudden these bigger traders would all of a sudden palms down, and they'd offer. They'd offer in size. So in that case, it was by a larger floor trader, but it was still a floor trader. The other, ex and so then one seller beget another seller beget, and the panic and the panic was on. Then you go to the diffusion model, and again you should re reread for the read for the first time or reread profiles, markets in profile, to make sure you do understand you understand the diffusion model and you understand. Um, early innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. We'll see that. We'll show you that. And we'll go back today and show you exactly where that, where that came in. The other example I used to use on the floor, so what if you inadvertently you know, pulled your handkerchief out of your pocket and just kind of snapped it a little bit just to open it up, and all of a sudden the floor starts selling because they think you're selling. It's that fickle. When the market gets too long or too short, it can be just that fickle. Um, now, let me go back to today. And when I was talking right here, 1821-25, 1821-75, I was on with my friend, and I'm saying, say, can you imagine the stops build up in this level? Now, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty comfortable my friend was still short. And because all of a sudden when this started up, when this started up here, it's got to go. And so what happens, the market, the, the first time down, they, they rally up in G period, two ticks of below Thursday's low at 1821.75. Some stops accumulate once we get through it. Very logical, you can see it. Comes up in G period, what do you do? You accumulate a, full, a few more stops. Well, it worked. You get more sellers to do it the second time. Well, it worked the first time. I'll do it a second time. It comes up a third time. They do it even more. Oh, boy. Traders do what works till it doesn't work anymore. Well, now you've got probably stops uh, above 75. You've got stops above all these three highs. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, it, 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 the, and I've, I've said this before, be careful the later in the day when there's less willingness to sell into it. So, yeah, there were probably not longer term money, but probably sh smarter, smarter, shorter term people that say, hey, they're short, and all of a sudden they bid this market up. So it was probably a, a larger, a larger, shorter term trader, but not, not another time frame trader. Shorter, longer than day time frame, but the shorter time frame that bids this market up, and boy, they caught them, and it was gone. That happens all the time. These, when particularly when the short time frame is in control, this is why I said this morning, uh, you know, I covered shorts. So I'm sorry, I should have said if you were short, um, it looks to me like the, the confidence is too low. But, you know, look at the market. One period, two period. The market's going down. What are most traders doing? They still think to sell it. Oh, boy, they're going to sell the rally, sell the rally, sell the rally, sell the rally. And they just keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter never got this low out, and then all of a sudden, they, every time they short, they've got their stops up here, and now they're just, you're, you're just waiting to be picked off. You know, a short-term trader, uh, a short-term trader, meaning more in the day time frame, that's pretty smart, he looks around, and all of a sudden, he just likes the big guys in the pit. All of a sudden, he says, bid, I'll bid for 5,000, or whatever the number is, and all of a sudden, one begets the other, begets the other. Now, as this starts going up, you know, you you get the uh, 
the innovators the innovators covered down here. When I put that note out this morning, the innovators are covering that covering down here. Then the early adopters are maybe covering up here. What do you think up here, when you get up here? You've got the early, late, and the laggards going here. The real laggards up here. It's that process that, that goes on. It's it's getting into the flow and understanding the behavior. People are going to do what works until it doesn't work. Ask yourself today, how many people, after seeing the market drop, how many people did very little trading here as the market was going the big opportunity, but they traded up a storm in this two and a half hour period or this three hour period? If you were trading up a storm in this three hour period, but you didn't do anything here, you know, you get yourself trapped down here. Anyhow, I hope that answers the, the question, but it happens continually and it's getting inside the mind of the people you're competing against. Understand what they're doing and understand how they're liable to react under different conditions. Another question, Julia. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, when does a five-day balance start after a directional day when I should be looking for balance? I know it's a rough, you know, an, a general oh, oh, question, oh, but if you could address balance and how you what, treat what is a, a five-day balance? Well, he's using that, but if you wanted to talk about how you start to establish a balance area, and you know, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. I well, just want to cover it. Well, the reason the reason that caught there is a there is a service out there that automatically um, talks about five day balances. I I I, I think it's ludicrous. Um, I just think it's ludicrous. Um, but I wanted to make sure that's not what you're ta what you're talking about. Uh, balance is I'm not balance. sure. I don't, know I don't know. I don't know when it stops. I don't know when it stops and starts, but I can tell you that when I look at when I look at Friday, Friday was inside uh, Thursday. That's balance. That's an inside day is a form of a form of balance. So now I when I got that, I've got a two day balance, and that two day balance goes from there down to there. Again, there's no magic to it. It's through observation, but it really starts. It starts by looking at the at the bar chart, looking at the inside bar. When I go and I look at the, uh, I extend the time a little bit, and I look at the, uh, um, the weekly. I look at the weekly. Um, it just forms. You know, I don't know it's starting to be a balance up here. I only kind of know it after the fact. But here I've got a three-week balance, and I've got a three, four, five, six-week balance down here. So it's it's in a lot of times balances are developing. They develop. They you you get a daily high, and then you go a little lower, then you exceed it a little bit the next day, and the value just the balance just kind of develops as the market continually auctions back and forth in its continuous two-way auction process. Okay, another question. Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, we have a couple of questions about trading balance, and we know this is a difficult um, thing to do that comes over time. Um, how, as far as expecting small moves when opening in balance, don't large moves begin from balance as well? And how do you consider that possibility, a breakout, as well as the possibility of the rotation and failure? When you see a market open, in, like last Thursday, open in the center of balance, if it's going out of balance that day, you're going to get a lot of single prints very early. So more than likely, it's not going out of balance that day. Mm -hmm. When you look at a day like today, once it failed at the top, you had the inside day, you had the two-day balance, you had significant single prints up here. Um, here, let's get significant, significant single prints up here. And then you failed to take, take out Friday's high. Now the chances are pretty good that they're going to target they're going to target the two day low you don't know if they're going to get it but pretty good chance they're going to target it target 1 was the point of control target 2 was friday's low you know and target 3 is here and you just you kind of got to go with it a, a kind of a 
just a section at a, at a time because there are there now no absolutes in this in this business the biggest clue to me today and this is why it develops when the early Let me use C let me use um I need to use the E mini. For those of you that get the chat or have read the stuff from me before, you constantly hear discussion about poor highs and poor lows. It's it's just it's just an absolute um, it's absolute constant. When you look this morning, first of all, let's take Friday's low. So we came down, D period, D period came down, and tagged Friday's low. I believe. That it, it, I think initially, I think D period tagged it. I think it left the um, the low down here, and the market the market rallied from there. So we had a poor low from today. We and, and if you mark that, you mark that against yesterday's low. So take for example yesterday's Friday's low, and you put that low with D. You've got the two a poor for the two day low. The market then rallied back up, and so this was a poor low down here, and you can see the chats there. There, the market came back down, took out that poor low. It's a good sign on the rally. Good sign it's going to take out that balance. Then look at the D period low. The D period low was one tick below the th the uh, Thursday's low. So this low, I think, what I wrote that weakens Thursday's low, and of course, then it finally comes down and takes. And takes that out. So I mean, you're 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 getting little clues along the line. The fact that this was a poor low was a clue that we're coming back. Poor low here was a clue we're coming back. But also, this is what makes it difficult. The back-to-back -back poor lows and bounces told you confidence wasn't that high. So that once it cleaned this business up, that may be the end of it. So the balance, you've got to take it a step at a time. This was an inside day. It failed at this side. Destination of the target becomes the opposite extreme. We got to the opposite extreme. You had a poor low. That increases the odds that you're going to take the, uh, you're going down to Thursday's low. Once we had the poor low at Thursday, uh, I put out the, the chat that said, I believe they said the next target was the, um, was the gap at the 1818 18 level. Uh, you, can, you can look at the chat comments and you can see in there. Julian's got those. Uh, you can see all those chats and you can see the sequence in which they happen. But again, if you're in the flow, if you're in the flow of the market, that stuff starts to fall out at you. Also, you know, once this market, once this market got down into this level, we're starting to get it, at a minimum unchanged value from Thursday, and then of course we get down here, we start to get overlapping to lower value. Once again, I say trade with developing value. Okay, another question, Julia. Again, again before we go on. We these are great questions. They're not answered in one session. They're answered through observation over and over and over again. If anybody's been following the chats or already signed up for the intensive, you see I've been I've been posting very heavily the past few days. Just getting people prepared to what I'm looking at and you know, some of those have been from pretty fortunate posts that are going out there. But you don't learn it in one in one day. This is the value of the intensity. We go over it and over it and over it. What you have to do is it's got to become internalized. It's got to become internalized so it relieves some of the stress. You have a better idea what the possibilities are, what can happen, and you operate with far less pressure. When you start operating with far less pressure, you tend to make better decisions. You tend to make fewer trades and you tend to get into the flow of the market. Okay, Julia, another question. Yes, sir, thank you. 
Question regarding developing value versus absolute value. Is it more important to look at value as it develops during the day, or are you looking at value as an absolute relative to the prior day? I'm, well, I do a couple things. If, if yesterday was a single distribution day, I'm constantly looking and estimating where I think value is going to be today. If yesterday was a double distribution day, I trade each day as a separate as a separate um, auction, and then I look at developing value relative to the distribution that I'm trading it. But I'm always sitting there saying, "Okay, what do I, what do I think value is going to be?" For example, when today starts to break and I get down in a poor low down here, and there's the low of there's the low of Friday's value. I get a pretty good idea. The worst case I'm going to get is unchanged value. The worst case I'm going to get an unchanged value, uh, I say, oh, I'm pretty safe probably trading to the to the short side, because don't forget, I've got an excess high. I've got a little short-term auction to the downside. So, you know, there are some things that lead me lead me in there. I say, okay, where do I want to trade? Where's some, and I say, I don't want to fade this market. I don't want to fade this market. Up to this, now, I don't want to fade the market to the downside. Uh, you know, you did get a big break here. You, you know, and but what I wrote, one of the things I wrote up, is that if you're going to if you're going to fade the daily trend, then use a time stop. You want to be right and be right very, very, very quickly. There are special circumstances. I looked at the stops developing in here. I saw that the high. That was a kind of a special circumstances. But then the other post this afternoon said I don't want to be long. You know, because this up in here. It just the and I said I don't want to be long. I'd be un I think I'm words where I'd be uncomfortable being long because the lift coming off of here was too weak. In other words, yeah, I got this short covering pop, which we know goes very fast. But after that, there's the there's the first pop J period. K L two hours later, I've only exceeded that J period high by five or six ticks. So it was all right here. So that's all, there was the short covering pop real fast. Call those, they just get those stops and just bang, bang, bang. And, you know, then you still got people wanting to buy it, or still the late, the laggards covering their shorts. But after this high, one, two, three, four, five ticks higher is all the market went in the next two hours. That's, it's that kind of thing. And I don't think I put that comment out until we'd been there for an hour, for an hour. It's that kind of analysis you're going through. You're not going to successfully trade the market with numbers. You're going to successfully trade the markets by understanding the behavior and getting in the flow of the market and understanding what the people you are competing against are doing. It will give you a tremendous edge. Remember, the percentage of people that make profits is very small. The percentage of people that are doing it all wrong is very high. You want to just the people right here, yeah, they were getting short-term rewards, but they were getting short in the hole. If you understood what was going on, one, you weren't short, and two, maybe you could have taken advantage of it. But more importantly, you weren't caught short. That's, I mean, it's just, it's a constant being in the flow, and that's what we're trying to do. Other questions? Yes, sir, thank you. Um, Last Thursday might be a good example of this. Jim, what would be a good reason or context to trade against developing value? And, it, you know, like last Thursday, the market's on all-time highs, low volume, value's higher, but at the same time, it seems like no, wait, 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 it was wait, wait, more wait, wait, the inventory wait, being very low. I don't long. know what day. I don't Thursday, know what, January 2nd. January Thursday was the second okay well on yep yeah okay all right now what's the question what would be a good reason or context to trade against developing value it, thursday the the ruling reason was that the market was just excessively long short in uh, long inventory from very fickle short term day traders so yeah the value was higher but we had to also Gauge wait, that wait, with wait, the inventory. Wait, 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 wait. Value is clearly lower. Here's Thursday, right here. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm thinking about the wrong. Maybe the uh, day prior. 
Well, that was the I last don't know, year Jim. Year. I, I can't remember. But just mm -hmm. there are opportunities or times when we would trade against value, but we'd also recognize that value can act as a restrainer in terms of, say, higher value and a downside break. If you play the odds, if you play the odds, the only time you're going to trade against developing value is if you, mar you just you get a structural place, the market gets too short, and you can see it's too short. Today might have been a great example of it. You know, when the market got too short down here, you may have done your, you may have traded against it right against value right here in J period. But if you're going to do that, if you've got a stop or this breaks out, then you've got you've got a structural place for your stop right here, and you're going to use a time stop. You want to be right very quickly. And that's why I look when I'm looking at this market, here it is after this hour, for the next two hours, you only get five ticks in the next hour. You only get five ticks above that. That's not much lift. So, you know, you can trade against it right here. You've got a place for a stop. You've got a place for a stop. You're going to go long. Um, you know, and you use a time stop. It's got to be right very quickly. Okay, additional questions. Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, what are your thoughts that the market couldn't hold below the nine-day trading range reference? I'm sorry. You got a daily bar there you could look to help them? Yeah, right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's, it's what I said. I already said this. Um, that's why we looked at the at the weekly. This is a go no go decision level, you know. And, and the balance trading rules apply here. What are the balance trading rules? You you stay in balance. You look below val balance and fail. You look below balance and accelerate lower. Balance trading rules are, are in effect. If you fail down here, you can rotate all the way back up. This isn't a particularly you know right home and brag about high up here. It was made you know. It made on a fictitious markup late in the end of the year. There's an anomaly up here, but for right now, you know, it's just a go no go no go no go decision level, and we apply the standard rules that we use for trading balance: stay within balance, look below balance and fail, look below balance and accelerate lower. It's it's no more difficult than that. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Um. This morning, Jim, in the first few minutes of trading, and I know you've covered this, you know, but just to walk through it, in the first few minutes of trading, what would be the reason to go short when the market rallied? I covered that extensively. The point of control, let me do it with CQG. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, people that were here early on. Um, I'll He's just been here the whole time. Okay, well, that's what I covered early on. The point of control, I said my ruling reason this morning was the point of control down here. Then the overnight inventory, when I wrote the, the pre-market or the pre-morning update this morning, the overnight inventory was a little long about balance. By the time we opened, the overnight inventory was very long. So at that point in time, I know there's a pretty high percentage that the, uh, the overnight inventory, there's a counter auction to it, and the final decision when it can't, stay above, it can't take out um, Friday's high, and it can't hold above the overnight high, right. uh, the overnight's clock. That's, that's the whole process. Okay, what else we got? During the day, is Mr. Dalton watching the markets um, with the uh, daily bars or just the market profile chart or both? I do my, I do my daily bar work prior to the market opening. Once the market opens, I'm pretty much using the market profile. I may have marked or know where the daily bars or the weekly lows and highs are. For example, 1818 was a significant reference. It was a gap. It was a weekly low. It was all kind of things. So, you know, but I've done a lot of that ahead of time. So I'm not frantically looking all over the place as the market's open, and I've got the references in my mind or marked. Just like if you look at the post today, you can just see them. I was just ticking them off. If we'd make one, I'd say, here's the next one, here's the next one. And it was, it was no stress. I already knew what it was. I'd marked. I'd thought about it ahead of time. But uh, okay. you know, occasionally I may, 
occasionally if the market catches me off guard, I may have to go back to the uh, to the uh, to the bar charts and see if I'm close to a monthly or a weekly high that I had forgotten about or got you know lulled to sleep because the market seemed too quiet. Okay, one mm -hmm. more question, then I want to do a little recap. Okay. Um. What signs, and this, this refers to references too, I've seen this question in, in, with re regard to references. What signs do you look for to determine that one directional auction has ended and a new auction has begun in the opposite direction? Well, ex excess, is the, uh, excess is the most common. Um, you know, excess marks the end of one auction and the beginning of another auction. Um, so that's the most common. Um, a breakout from balance is the same thing. A breakout from balance marks the start of a new auction. Uh, you know, of course, if it fails, uh, then you're going the other direction. But those are the those are the primary things I'm I'm looking for. Now, but I'm using 30-minute bars. You know, if you're using if you're using five and 15-minute bars, you're not going to see what I see. You're going to see too much detail. You're going to be you're going to be uh, misled. The best thing I can find is using the 30-minute bar, okay? Um, but it's excess. Excess is the most excess is the most important concept you'll ever deal with. Uh, and and last, lack of and what's a little confusing there is lack of excess can also be important, particularly when a market is too long or too short. So sometimes you'll have a new auction start with no excess because the market was too long or too short. But generally, you will be able to see the flow leading up to it that will give you some indication that that is, that is a potential. For example, the market's going lower, but the point of control isn't migrating lower with you. Okay, let me do a, just a, a, a quick review, and I'm not going to do it necessarily in the order in which I started. I'm going to suggest for those getting ready for the intensity, step one, do a really heavy, serious self-assessment of where where you think your weaknesses are. Now, they can be what you know and what you don't know about the market. You may say, I've got a weakness in education here. That's one thing. You, that, that you can do. You can go and fill that in. We can help you fill that in. The other self-assessment is each one of us has certain psychological problems in trading. We may get too anxious. Uh, we may not be able to let the profit run. We may, you know, we may impulsively want to trade early. We may impulsively fade trend days. You know, I have no evidence whatsoever that there's any benefit in, in fading a trend day. You know, and if, if you have this tendency to fade trend days, then you, want, you need to put that down as a self-assessment. Because what is, you're, you're getting anxious. So, wow, you know, maybe your thing was I missed it. It's a trend day down, and you missed the trend day down, so you're really angry. So you let it go down, and then you buy it later in the day. You buy it later in the day because you think you're going to get even. You're going to show them, and the market continues on, on down. One of the things, you need to record that. You need to be honest with that. One of the things you're going to find when you read the book about habits, that behavior right there, let's say you missed the trend day in the morning, and in this afternoon you decided to fade it. You get a momentary reward when you fade that trend day. You get this momentary relief. I did something. I took action. I'm going to show them. Now, granted, it doesn't last very long, and you usually go from that momentary reward to a much deeper funk shortly thereafter because you did it for the wrong reason. But that is a habit, and you've got to do the self you've got to do the self assessment very honestly so you know as we go into the intensity what you really want to work on. So the self-assessment is, is first. Understand what knowledge you, market knowledge you need versus how much is the self-assessment and psychological things that may be hindering your, your performance. In the preparation, I can't stress enough, read and reread the power, the power of habits. It is it is a game changer as far as I am concerned. You will see things in there that you've heard me talk about before. I've been around the edges of it. They talk about willpower. Here, Julia and I talk about, you know, you only have so much mental capacity. 
you know, psychological capacity. Once you use that up, you start making more and more mistakes. They address the same thing with willpower. Uh, those are in there from overtrading. But read the book. Um, if you get time, reread um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Very, very helpful. Okay, once you do that, once you've done that self-assessment, now start focusing on that, that idea, one of the things you'll see in the book is this idea of keystone, keystone habits. A keystone habit is a habit that if you change that habit, it may influence all other habits. So you're not going to change a lot of things at one time. You're looking for a keystone habit to change. Okay? Go through, that's where I want you to start. Then go back and review the slides today. How do you prepare? Maybe you're already doing all that preparation. How are you preparing? You know, are you looking at the monthly, the weekly, the daily, and the profiles? Are you doing your at least three? You're not limited to three, but at least three scenarios. So you've thought this out ahead of time. Ask yourself, you know, where's your odds? If you all you have to go back and look at these days, and if you trade with value, you're going to find that your odds are much greater. I suggest that is one of the keystone habits. But get to the point. So you know, you understand that the market's opening in balance or out of balance. You understand the overnight inventory is long or short. You start to understand the potential. You start to get inside the head of those that you are trading against. Those are the people you're competing against. The majority of the people you are competing against are almost always wrong. That's where, that's the importance of understanding what they're doing because they're generally wrong. If you're doing what they're doing, you, you, I mean, this, is, this, isn't, this isn't so simple that you're always doing it. It's at the, it's at the extremes. It's at the, it's at the margins. But do your preparation. Have your scenarios. Do your pre, have your pre-opening routine down. Have your routine down. What are you routine down? What are you going to do once the market's open? What are you looking for? Have your whatever abbreviated initials you're going to use to mark what's happening. Actually write it down once the market's opening. Now you're going to be higher or lower. Did I take off this reference? The high or the low, is it good or bad? You can go back over the charts tonight. Get yourself prepared so then when we go through the 60 days, the, one of the things that always sticks in my mind, and you heard in the last intensive, you heard Julia mention the name Martin a lot. You know, Martin was a guy that became very successful. He was successful on the floor. He then became very successful off the floor. One of the things he kept saying, you cannot hear this enough. It just keeps reinforcing it till it's internalized. Anyhow, um, I hope there's a lot of you that are joining us have either already uh, signed up and are getting the, the, the daily reports and are getting the chat comments. Um, and those that haven't, I hope you join us. We will do everything we can to give you the best 60-day program we possibly can. Anyhow, thank you all very much, and uh, have a great new year. Okay, Jim, thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for being here. And what we're going to do is um, extend the $100 discount for the intensive that ended December 15th, but we've created a coupon code. Um, here it is. Uh, that if you plug that in, $100 discount extended, um, that will knock off $100 if you are interested to go forward. So um, we hope you'll take advantage of that or at least give it a, a thought. And um, again, we thank everyone here for you know participating. We've had some wonderful questions, and um, we appreciate you uh, taking the time out. So everyone, thank you again. Have a great night. This webinar will be posted this evening. And uh, any questions you have, you're welcome to call us or email us, okay? And uh, thank you, Mr. Dalton, again, and thank you, everyone. Good night.